beautiful Sunday morning. Before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity to come to your house today. Thank you for keeping us safe and having us back here this morning. Thank you for the many, many blessings in my life, dear Lord. Thank you for another communion Sunday. It's been too long. Thank you for what this means. Most of all, I want to thank you for your son and for providing a way for us. Please be with our service today, dear Lord. Be with the singing. Be with Brother Hunter as he brings us a message. Help us to take it and apply it to our lives and to use it. Help us to be a light to you out there where we go to work, or school, wherever we may go. Help us to be a light for you. Please be with those that are sick, the ones on our prayer request list, and please be with the lost, most importantly. I thank you for so much for all that you've done for me. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I've got a few announcements this morning. First things first, no evening service this evening uh, so we can be with our family, celebrate Memorial Day, remember what Memorial Day is all about. Remember what it's all about. We will have Wednesday Bible School, June the 2nd and the 16th at 7 p.m. Brother Rob will be leading the message, leading the, the teaching. Uh, remember the Morning Star Rest Home Service, 6 p.m. or 6.30 p.m. on June the 9th. Um, the trip to the Samaritan's Purse, the Operation Christmas Child, this Saturday has been canceled. Um, choir practice will start next Sunday at 10 a.m. If you're interested in singing in the choir, please be here then. And to support Becky in her fight against cancer, we have started a t-shirt fundraiser. It is, He Can Heal Cancer. And he can. So I think we will have some of these out and about, probably in the vestibule, I guess. Or just, have, yep, never mind. She handed them out already. All right. Do we have anything else? Church service tonight's canceled, yeah. Anything else? If not, we'll continue with the service. If you'll get your hymn books out, we're going to start with America the Beautiful. I'm going to change it up a little bit. We're going to sing first, third, and last. I'm shaking it up. Page 630 in the hymn book. Page 630 in the hymn book, America the Beautiful.
page 634. 634, My Country, Tis of Thee. We'll sing all four. It is good to be in God's house this morning. Amen. 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 I tell you what, as, uh, as we prepare this morning, we're going to do something that I have been absolutely on my edge to do. The Lord's Supper. I love communion. I love it. I love it. But I tell you what, before we do that, and as we look at the greatest memorial and the greatest thing that we could ever do to look back on what Jesus did for each and every one of us, this morning I want each one of you to please stand if you can. Please stand with me if you can. Everybody, look to the person beside you, either to the right or to the left. And I want you to say this, Jesus, Jesus. Died, died for you. I love you. You may be seated. Now for wives and husbands, that was easy. For men, that might have been a little funky, but it's all right. We have brotherly love. We have brotherly love in Christ Jesus. This morning, if you have a copy of God's Word, I ask you to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this morning, we are going to be preaching on and looking at the Word of God for this subject, the reasons for the Lord's Supper. Reasons for the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Go to your New Testament, go to the end of the Gospels, end of the book of Acts and Romans, it will be your next book, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we will be in verse number 23. I'll allow you some more time to turn. What this letter is, is an epistle from the Apostle Paul actually correcting those who are in opposition to the truth of God's Word and to true practices. The Corinthian church was a church that had a bad known reputation for being one that done things the wrong way. 
They went in a very bad direction with many things, exalted things they shouldn't have, practiced things they shouldn't have. And what the Apostle Paul did, he said, listen, you've got to get it straight. You've got to get it straight. And what he did is what he found out is there were folks coming to the Lord's Supper who were wanting to come and get a snack. They were wanting to come and get a little edible snack. They wanted to try to take four pieces of bread rather than just the one. They wanted to get a gallon of juice or a gallon of wine rather than actually coming to partake of the Lord's Supper for the reason it was instituted. So if you have your Bible open, we'll be 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse number 23. The Bible says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Verse number 27 Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord God, we ask you to speak to us in this time, and as we go forward to prepare our hearts and our minds to take of your supper, that we would be prepared spiritually to partake of what you did. Lord God, we love you and we praise you, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning as we look at the reasons for the Lord's Supper, we begin going down through the text of something. And what we see is that Paul was wanting to make sure that his beloved church of the Corinthians in Corinth, he wanted to make sure their worship was full. Their worship was on point. Their worship was full of what God had for them to do, of what Christ wanted of them. And this morning we see that in the first place in the reasons for the Lord's Supper, Paul goes forward and tells, first of all, it is an expectation of our Lord. You know, many times people say, why do we pray? Well, one good reason and the best reason of all is this. Jesus did. Amen? Amen. Jesus prayed. Therefore, Jesus prayed is a good example. We should also pray. But Jesus also said to pray. Pray in like manner. He told the apostles and the, and the early disciples how to pray. When he got into that upper room, when he got into the place, and he said there in verse number 23, I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took the bread. He took the bread. And you go on in verse number 24. He said, take. Now you see when he says take, what he's doing there is he's literally, he took the bread that we will be partaking shortly. He took the bread of the, uh, of the new covenant, or excuse me, the bread of his body, and he said, this bread is broken for you, take it. Now he didn't tell us, you know if you're feeling like it, you can maybe try. You know if you're up to it, you should consider it. He says no. He didn't give an option. Take it. Take it. It's not optional if you know you're feeling up to it. It's not optional if you know you're kind of in the way with it on His standings. He tells us to take the bread. But He also goes forward in verse number 25. In the same manner, He also took the cup. 
Now the cup is the image in the, of the new covenant that is in His blood. What it is, is the covenants of God through Abraham, through that of Noah, through Abraham, through Moses, through David. You have these different covenants of the Lord. And then finally, in the person of Jesus Christ, all of the covenants come to the final completion of God's finished work. And He takes the cup and He says, This is My blood. Drink it. Drink it. It's an expectation of our Lord because not only did He take the bread and He took the cup, He says, do and take of this. This is my body. Do this. But He tells us something. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of Me. Do it in remembrance of Me. On this Memorial Day, I look back at some of our founding fathers. Roger Williams, a man who came over a man who left where he was over in England and he came to this great nation of ours in the very beginning because he wanted religious liberty. He wanted to be able to practice his faith. He wanted to be able to go and he wanted to be able to stand and say, this is God's Word. He did it in remembrance of his Lord. We are in Memorial Day looking back on not only the memory of this nation over time and all that was, has been paid for this great nation, but look back farther. Look back farther. Look back 2,000 years. Look back to a bloody cross. Look back to when there was a tattered man with blood flowing from his face, flowing from his veins, nail-scarred hands, pierced feet, a purple robe, a sign, the King of the Jews. Memorial Day must go back farther. In memory of what we must all stand on, the greatest memorial of all, do this in remembrance of me. It's an expectation of our Lord to think back every time we take of the cup and say, Jesus, You paid it all. You paid it all. You did everything I couldn't. You paid what I could not. You live the way I can't. You are what I need. You are my all in all. Thank You, Lord. It's an expectation of our Lord for us to take of the Lord's Supper. But secondly, secondly, you see going forward in the text in verse number 26, not only is this an expectation of our Lord, it is an expression of our faith. It is an expression of our faith. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, the Bible says, you proclaim the Lord's death. You see that word there, what he's saying is you are literally speaking forth every time you take of the body and the, and the blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper. You are showing it and proclaiming His death. And what that means is this. <coughs> It's an expression of his faith because of his faith because first of all you're proclaiming his sufficiency. I'm telling you what folks, in our day today people need to know this and this alone. Jesus Christ is enough. Amen. He's enough. We don't need Jesus and we don't need Jesus or we don't need Jesus with, we don't need Jesus if. Jesus alone. Amen. That's all we'll ever need. That's all we have ever needed. We don't need anything else. So often folks go, well, you know, the Bible and. No, we need the Bible alone. It's God's Word. It is spoken from the mouth of Jesus. It is His Word. It is literally the Word of God inspired. All of Scripture is inspired, Paul tells us. All we need is Jesus. And what he says there is this. He says, if you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. He died once. He died for all. All. I said He died for all. Amen. Every one of us. He died for all. His death is sufficient. He doesn't have to go to the cross every single time, no matter what some other beliefs is. He doesn't go to the cross every time we take. He went one time. You proclaim His death once. He died once and for all. He died. You proclaim His sufficiency. Jesus' death is enough. His death is enough. But also you proclaim the consistency. Think about this. In verse number 26 it says, You proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. 
I tell you what, the second thing we all need, underneath that Christ is all we'll ever need, is that Christ will all we'll ever need every day. We get so back and forth sometimes. We'll get so mix-matched and flim-flammed and flabbergasted all the time. We're just sold out this day, missing this day, falling this day, glorified this day. Consistency. The Lord's death till He comes every single day. He could come today. What happens when we go to sleep tonight? He can come tomorrow. Amen. What happens when we go to sleep tomorrow night? He can come, to, he can come the next day. He can come on Monday. He can come on Tuesday. He can come on Wednesday. He can come on Thursday. He can come on Friday. He can come at 2 o'clock. He might come at 5 o'clock on Friday. Amen. Amen. That way we ain't even got to worry about the weekend. We go into the glorified eternal weekend. He could come any day consistently and constantly proclaiming His death. Not only is it sufficient, but it's good enough for every day. Every day. Till He comes. Till He comes. Till He comes. Till He comes. Jesus is coming. Constantly taking of it and taking that cup. Whenever we lift that cup up, we lift the bread up and we go, He broke for me once. He died for me once. He spilled it for me once. Today. Tomorrow, the next day, the next day. It's an expression of our faith. It is an expression of our faith that Jesus is enough and He is coming back for me. He is coming back for all those who are in Christ Jesus. He is coming back for all of us in the church. Jesus Christ is coming and our communion is an expression of our faith. Point number three. Not only is it an expectation of our Lord or an expression of our faith, it is an exercise of our devotion. Now you see, this is when you start getting hairy. I'm going to go ahead and tell you now, it's about to get hairy. Because I'm going to tell you to judge. Not because I said it, because the Word of God said it. The Bible says, that's good enough for me, ain't you? The Bible says here in verse number 28, it's the main part of this entire thing uh, going forward. It's an exercise of our devotion. Verse number 28 says, But let a man examine himself. Examine himself. Now, ladies, this is not just talking about let a man do it. This is talking about mankind. All of us are to do it. Every one of us are to do it. Let us examine ourselves. You go on in verse number 31. For if we would judge ourselves we would not be judged. So this is when it gets hairy. You ever taken your Bible, open it up? You're guilty of that. Oh, you're definitely guilty of that. Oh, yeah, no, I definitely know you. You're guilty of that one too. See, I'm a saint. I don't ever fail. Oh, gosh. Oh, there's definitely one right there, sitting right there. Mm-hmm. Guilty of that all the way through. Shame on you. Shame on... Mm, shame on you. Oh, shame on you. Is that what that says? No. That says if we would examine and judge ourselves, we would open our Bibles and say, God... There's something between me and you. I've sinned. Get it out. God, I'm the problem. It's not them. It's not you. It's not someone else. It's not what they said. It's not something else they did. It's me. It's an exercise of our devotion. And if we would be grown up enough and would be spiritually mature enough that before we took the cup, we would be willing and devoted enough and obedient enough to our Savior that we would look at the cup and we would look at the bread and say, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. But most of us fail from what and we see in the Gospel of John. We don't want to do that because we go, well, if I put this down, what are people going to think? Who cares what people think? What does God think? 
But being mature enough and devoted enough and exercising our faith and devotion to the Lord enough and being able to look at the Word of God and say, am I taking this in a good conscience and guiltless in the blood or am I doing something wrong? Do I have a grudge? Is there someone that I just will not forgive? Or... Do I go to someone and I say, Jesus is enough, but then you need to act like this. You just took Jesus down and you put your practices above Him. You did. That's what you just did. See, Jesus is enough to save you, but you know you really ought to be like this. You literally just took Jesus down. It got quiet. Have you done that? Have we done that? Have I done that? Examine ourselves. Examine ourselves. Stop turning on the TV to them, them two-digit channels. Well, one digit as well. Three, four, 62, 40, 21. And saying, my Lord, look at all these people. Look at me. Look at me. God, what's in me? What's my problem? Am I not trusting You? Is there something between me and You, Lord? Do I have a spirit of, of, of greed? Do I have a spirit of just of lust? Do I have a spirit of anger? Judging ourselves. And being willing and mature enough and devoted enough to, to take it to the Lord and say, God, fix it. Fix it. Fix it. But then point number four. It is an experience of our communion. You see, in verse number 33, we see one of the most glorious portrayals of the body of Christ you've ever seen in your life. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Wait for one another. That, 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 that has so many different meanings in it. That doesn't just mean to just sit back and just kind of, oh, just wait on them. At the same time, that has the same meaning that you take it and you bow before them. And you serve them as a waiter. Well, I'm not bowing before them. They did me wrong. You might have a grudge. You need to judge yourself. I'm better than they are. They need to bow, or I, they need to, bow to me. Jesus washed people's feet. The God of glory washed feet. He said, wait for them. We're the body of Christ. I tell you what, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I have never been so bothered and burdened than lately because there's, it seems as if the body of Christ is just completely splitting. It is. Our denominations are getting farther apart. Our denomination as our denomination in the Southern Baptist are getting farther apart. We're splitting over everything, over hair. We just keep splitting and keep splitting and keep splitting. Well, I don't like this. Well, I don't like that. How about you shut up and act like a good Christian for a change? And put God above your own preference. Amen. We're so divided. And this nation's divided. And we keep trying to say we're going to unify over all this political mess. Christ unifies. There is one body in Him. There is one blood that was shed. There is one cross. Amen. We need Him. We don't need political reform. We don't need anything but Jesus. Amen. That's what we need. That's what we need. We need to be in the body of Christ as one. Not dividing over every single thing. And we are. We're so divided. And we won't come together. 
Right now in the SBC, I'm telling you right now, there's so much hate. They don't like this side. They don't like this side. Now, of course, one side is pushing something that is completely wrong. They are. It is completely and totally wrong to say that there's no such thing as truth unless all races agree on it. That is bull hockey. It is. It's junk. But we need to come together and say, brother, you're in the air. Sister, you're in the air. Now, I got my sins. I'm a sinner just like you. I thank God for His grace. And you need to repent and get right with God. You need to. But we got to get right together. we got to get unified. We do. And before we take the Lord's Supper, I want to end on this illustration i got two names. I know every one of you have heard one of them. A man by the name of Martin Luther. You ever heard the name? The Great Reformer. 1517, the Great Reformation, Martin Luther. There's another one named Ulrich Zwingli. You probably ain't heard that one much, have you? No, most people haven't. He actually came before Luther, right before it. Martin Luther and Zwingli debated a whole lot of things. Went back and forth, argued, all this different stuff. So finally, they came together and they made a list of 15 doctrines. And they said, we're going to agree on every one of these. They got 14 of them down pat. But there was one of them that divided them and they would no longer affiliate together. Martin Luther said he believed because of what the Gospel of John said. Jesus said, this is my body. That when you take the Lord's Supper, it becomes the Lord's body. It's called co-substantiation. Or consubstantiation. Yeah, that's a big word. That whenever you drink the blood, it becomes the blood. It, be, it has a, a spiritual element. It's a big, powerful meaning. Zwingli, on the other hand, said, no, it's a memorial. We take it in honor, in reverence, and in memory of the Lord and His death. Luther wouldn't budge. They were together on 14 other things. They believed in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believed in the flesh and blood humanity of Jesus. They believed He died once for all. They believed that, but it come down to the Lord's Supper. And Zwingli, historian said with tears in his eyes, put his hand out. He said, take my hand. He said, just agree to disagree. Be my brother in the faith. Take it. Take my hand. Let's be the body of Christ. Let's not be petty. Take my hand. Be my brother. Martin Luther said, absolutely not. It come later on that Martin Luther said, he's a good man. He's a good man, but has a bad spirit. And then come later on, Martin Luther said, I guess God just blinded him. He chose his own personal preference. And he held to the conviction strongly. But he divided the body of Christ at that moment. Now history tells us this. See, they didn't know what they were doing at that moment. Martin Luther had no idea what he was doing at that moment. But in that moment when Zwingli had his hand out and said, Take it, my brother. Take my hand. He said, No. The body of Christ at that moment split. How split we have become. How split we have become. Look at the church of America. We won't come sit together in pews to take the Lord's Supper on half occasions. We get fussed, fussy and frustrated with each other over little things. The body of Christ is one. Jesus died for them just like He died for me and just like He died for you. So this morning, 
as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, remember, this is not one body for the Baptists and one body for those Methodists. This is one body. One body. This is not a body for the Southern Baptists and one for the Independent Baptists. This is one body. Jesus Christ died for the church, not some churches or a church. He died for the church, His people. And as we take that this morning, and before you partake of it, it's gonna, and this morning I'll explain here in just a moment. Examine yourself. Am I worthy to take this right now? Am I pouring judgment upon myself by taking this cup? Am I worthy to take this cup? Jesus said, take and eat. But am I pouring judgment on myself by taking this cup? I'm going to pray over right now as we, just, as we finish our message this morning and our deacons are going to come forward. They're going to remove the cloth. If you have the ability to get up and come forward, please do. Come to the center aisles and come down. We have new cups now. They're prepackaged. Everything's prepackaged now. If you have the ability, please come down. If you do not have the ability, just raise your hand. We will be happy to come and wait on you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for what you did for us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for shedding your blood. You went and paid a price that no one could ever pay except you. And now by your grace and your mercy, not only do you give us eternal life in heaven, but you give us life now. You have given us a life in you that only you could give us, and we thank you for it. We praise you and we give you all the glory on this Memorial Day, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Deacons, if you would. Please, if you have the ability to come down, if you would, please come down the center aisle. And as you come and you get a cup, take it back to your seat. And we'll sit down and we will go through the Lord's Supper together. If you would, please come to the center aisle and make your way down now, please. If you would, I didn't, yeah, I didn't think about that. Yes, if you would. <laughs> now, if you were unable to come down if you would and you were unable to make it if you would just raise your hand slightly so Grant can see who to come to
Christ broken for you. The blood. This is the blood and the body of Christ broken for you. Thank you, my brother. Now I'm going to tell you, there's a trick. Hmm? They come down. Yeah, they come down. Uh, we have everybody from the nursery to the sound room has got a cup. There's a trick. I'm going to go ahead and walk you through it real quick. There is a small, thin piece of plastic on top of the tab. You have to kind of reach down there for it. Do not pull the thick piece because it will pull the entire thing off and you'll be in the juice. You have to pull just a small, thin piece of plastic. looks like cellophane. That will give you your cup or your bread. by fire with them. It's a lot more difficult than the old fashioned, ain't it? <laughs> it is. I hear the rough one. But as you look at this bread, this wafer, the Bible tells us that in the Gospels, Jesus said he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take it and eat it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we look back right now, thank you for your body. You broke it. For us. You were broke for me. And thank you, Lord. And we give you all the glory. Amen. Now as you take the cup, this is when you grab the thick tab and it pulls back just like a creamer on coffee for all you coffee drinkers. Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Take it and drink it. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the new covenant that you hold. Lord God, thank you for shedding your blood on Calvary, going to the mercy seat, putting this blood on the mercy seat. That now as we look back and worship You, we thank You. God, we thank You. Christ, we give You the glory. And thank You for paying a debt that only You could pay. It is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. We have another thing today that I want to bring to the church and let them know of something. Brother Jim, would you please come down if you do not mind? Hello, Jim. Good to see you, brother. Yes, sir. Uh, the other week, we received a care card. A uh, care card had Mr. Jim's name on it. He wrote on it, filled out the information, and checked on the back. Need to speak to a pastor about becoming a church member. I reached out to Jim and called Jim, and we had a good conversation the other day. Um, Jim has come forward and wants to, um, has showed interest in becoming a member of this church. Of course, he will go to our new membership committee, but just wanted to share that with everybody that Jim has come forward. We're going to set up a time to meet with him and the new membership committee that we can talk with Jim, but uh, I'm confident that Jim is very, he's a godly man, saved uh, years ago, and it's just great to know that he showed interest now, uh, but I did. I wanted to let everybody know that Jim has showed interest at being a member of our family here. Jim, I love you, and I look forward to speaking with you with the new membership committee, my friend. Everybody, love you, Jim. <laughs> grace, would you like to come and lead us in amazing grace? You can stay right there, but I'm not leading. Yeah. In acapella. <laughs> amazing grace. How sweet the 
sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now. You all have a blessed and wonderful day. Hope to see you back Wednesday night. Enjoy your holiday tomorrow and just remember what Jesus paid for you. I love you all. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm. Not too bad.